Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because I know that people will look at this uh, video maybe from different time zones in this uh, global world. So my name is Maurizio Gazzola. Um, I've been working for the UN for the last 19 years. Actually, a few days ago, I marked my 19th year in the UN. You can see from my gray hair that has been a very interesting um, adventure, let's put it that way. So thanks to, to FOSS Backstage and uh, for Is uh, to Isabel as well for inviting me today. And uh, I will try to go through some, some of the key concepts that I would like to have discussed maybe in the next few days while in, in FOSS Backstage and then uh, thereafter. So um, today we will we'll be talking about um, you know, three main concepts, the open source culture, what we call the open source culture, the digital public goods, and all of this put in the context of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So I'll have a presentation on the screen. And uh, first of all, though, I will have to uh, read the disclaimer so that everybody is, is happy about it. So the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are of the author and do not necessarily represent the official position of the United Nations. Mention of uh, firms' names and commercial products does not imply the endorsement of the United Nations. So we are now okay and we can proceed. So today's topic, um, as you can see on the screen, I have a, I have decided to put a, a, a map of Africa uh, with some key kind of uh, um, uh, concept that we will want to we want to discuss and. Um, Open source software, obviously, in my view, and, and everybody's view is ubiquitous, so it's everywhere. But the true open source resolution, in my view, is really goes beyond the, the ability to open the establishing open software. So the collaboration methods, the principles around engaging open source project in, in open source project touch really deep into establishing new society, society paradigm and working together across boundaries laying the foundation of a true ubiquitous open source culture. So today we will we'll go through some, some ideas around how we leverage and achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the famous SDGs, by sti stimulating an open source culture. And how do we embed the, the open source software development methods and uh, in, in the establishment of the digital public goods? so that we support a global society which is fair, inclusive, and that does not leave really anybody behind. We also try to think about how we empower the developing countries to accelerate in their progress and through technology solutions and feeding from really a strong open source culture. And how do we, we, we do open business? What are the open business models at our horizon that uh, are resting on inclusivity, participation, universal access, for achieving the, the SDGs. So how can we remain in business actually, and uh, at the same time, enable impact and obviously generate revenue at the same time. So this is a bit what, uh, you know, a, a teaser of what we're gonna be talking uh, about today. But obviously first things first, you know, uh, I'm working for the Office of Information and Communication Technology, which is really a, an entity in the UN Secretariat that is servicing around 100,000 users in 189 countries, mainly, you know, on one side providing infrastructure, ICT um, services uh, like email, internet, video conferences, and all the rest, so all the infrastructure work. And another part of ICT where, where I actually work uh, is really supporting member states in the adoption of technology to achieve the sustainable development goals. And these are the few things and items and, and major areas that we are working on. Obviously, you see data is, is a big part of it, uh, you know, innovation and technology solutions. Um, my team, the Strategic Technology Solutions uh, um, uh, team, is, is working on integrating emerging technology in software solution that we offer and install in member states for daily provision of services to their citizens. So we configure, we scale, we support a, a, a large suite of products uh, from for our small team. And um, these products are, are in, a, in a suite called Go Portfolio. Go st stands for government office and include uh, technology solutions that are um, our uh, substantive entities of the UN, like the Office on Counterterrorism, the Human uh, Settlement uh, Organization, UNICEF and others are actually offering within their programs. So, for example, we have a counterterrorism travel program that offers a solution for 
tracking terrorists traveling through commercial air, uh, the countering of financial ter financing of terrorism program to uh, track money laundering and countering terrorism financing on, on the banking sector and so on. Um, just to give you a bit more information, you know, the, the, the Go Travel solution is really for passengers information unit to detect and counter terrorist travel and uh, basically allows the countries to collect uh, passenger name records and do analysis on this data to detect uh, serious uh, uh, criminals and, and terrorists uh, coming into the country and going out of the country. The financial intelligence system, GovIntel, is really the platform to detect um, money laundering patterns and financial terrorism patterns in their, in their data sets. So again, member states collect this data from many, at, at this point, from, from the uh, banking sector and does tactical, strategical and operational analysis on, on this data. We also built uh, a solution for land management. So for in the context of uh, the work that UNIC, uh, sorry, UN Habitat has been doing in Afghanistan. So we built a blockchain based solution for Afghanistan. Then of course, unfortunately, when we were ready to go live, uh, something happened in Afghanistan that you know, I know you all remember. So we got a bit stuck there, but the solution now is an offer with, uh, for other countries who are using or who, are, who, are, who need this type of uh, uh, work uh, and, and technology for um, managing land registries. And, and obviously the last but not the least and uh, probably the, the most impactful at this point is the Golan solution with a wide level uh, national learning solution and in India we set an amb ambitious target to reach 1 million primary students and teachers in 2022 and we are actually already halfway so uh, the program is, is doing very well. Just to give you a, a, a very quick setup, 16 more than countries are, are joining both the adoption of the solutions so we have 950,000 records of properties registered in land registry and so far 250,000 course completion certificates issued so far. So having done this work for, for a few years, maybe or, or almost two decades, um, what, what, what did we learn? Um, we learned that there's a huge demand from, from state, regional, but also local uh, administration for technology solution. They need concrete technology solution. And it's not just the developing world that is uh, looking for this, but also the developed member states. And uh, all are struggling to keep up with the citizen demands, you know, everywhere. And um, the struggle for administration is on one side to establish legal frameworks, sorry, legal frameworks, so policy and legal work around what needs to be done, what kind of services and, and, and solution that needs to be adopted in line with international conventions and legal instruments. But on the other side, there is, you know, the, the, the big question, so how, how appropriate is the technology that they, they are using? How other type of technology needs to be adopted to support the, the implementation of these regulations and frameworks, legal frameworks, in providing services to member states? So this is a, a big demand that we've been hearing for, from, from our um, uh, counterparts. Countries, obviously, who have the resources both financial and non-financial, so human resources as well, and expertise and, and knowledge, may invest in this in, in establishing this system themselves, but ironically to do the same work that another country also needs to do, because everybody's part of a whole international framework for providing uh, services to, the, to their citizens. So countries, although they, they, they don't have financial or human resources, actually obviously fall beha behind. And, uh, and not always there is the appreciation that there are three main components of a successful technology adoption path, which is really combining the policy work, the legal work and the technical work. So all of these three elements need to need to work together. And, um, you know, just to give you an example, the obligation against terrorism of have a na national, of course, but also supranational impact. Right. So uh, actors have to deal with the same problem in the same coordinated way if the policies and the legal environments are, are, are um, uniform obviously the technology if the technology also is uniform obviously the countries can have a better impact into into what they decided to to proceed with particularly in this area of of country tourism but in many other areas um we actually did learn that to date the, the private sector interest for this type of product is still on a niche. 
And what administration are struggling with is the vendor lock-in. So whenever they make a decision, they have to put into their balance sheet a certain vendor lock-in component uh, to whatever decision they made. So member states obviously continuously assume international obligations. So new treaties or changes to existing treaties, United Nations uh, resolution, the Security Council resolution, all of this impact the legal and the policy framework that needs to have a, a, the, the technology following suit. So the software solution used in the public sector needs to be continuously updated. So it's not just a, a buy once and, and forget, as, as you all know. And obviously, there are always evolving human rights, privacy legislation requirements that needs to be uh, embedded into this solution. Uh, all countries seem to be reinventing the wheel, basically, and not benefited from economies of scale. Uh, the system updates are really done in silos. So whatever is done in, in, in one country may not necessarily is shared and, and needs to be redone from scratch in another country. So the best practice of sharing and, and innovative methods of service citizens may be working very well in certain parts of the world and not in others. Um, and there is obviously a, a, a complete understanding now of, by, by all countries who are facing the same global common problems that is essential to collaborate, include, open up, and leverage uh, mainstream and innovative uh, technology. So this is a major, major learning. So what happened in, in the meantime? In the meantime, the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals have been you know, published and uh, have been you know, uh, leveraged uh, and understood uh, by worldwide. And these are uh, you know, key elements to, to frame uh, the problems and frame the legal, the policy and the technology support to the solution of this problem and, and, and addressing the challenges that the SDGs are bringing with them. Um, um, so what has happened in, in the meantime is really that once the SDGs were published, all actors of the society realized they have equal responsibility towards the achievement of the SDGs. So there's a full acknowledgement now that the all actors of, of the society cannot solve these global problems alone. They need to collaborate, they need to include, include they need to work together to, to address the same global problem that everybody is facing to achieve the SDGs. And also the second general roadmap for digital cooperation has been issued and recognizes that the United Nations needs to really expand the competitive advantage of connecting, including all the actors and ensure, and ensure that you know, nobody is, is left behind in the achievement of the SDGs. Um, another big thing that happened in the meantime is really the, the establishment of the a clear understanding around the digital public goods. And obviously, the Digital Public Goods Alliance has been instrumental to this. This, as you know, is, a, is a, um, a, an, initi an initiative from the government of Sierra Leone, Norway, um, and UNICEF. And uh, um, one of the, the key uh, deliverables of this alliance is really also to um, not only establish the understanding of what the digital public good is, but also creating a register of these of this digital public goods. So, as you know, in the meantime, the technology innovation has tremendously accelerated uh, and new systems uh, are coming up with all kinds of new emerging technology that are really defining the new rules of, of the society. So, uh, open source software, open collaboration, open data, open, I would say, open anything is something that is really underlying uh, the establishment of, a, of an open culture. And we find it from our perspective that this is very enticing for new generations, and this is very encouraging. And um, at the same time, is is at the core of producing new business model to that combine the impact, the social impact, and the revenues uh, gathering. So that's a um, very important component of what what has happened in the meantime. And of course, if you go back to the preamble of the United Nations charters, you know, we the people of the United Nations, um, we, are, we are considering, and many are considering this as the foundation of the open, open culture of today, because the charter has been covering 
equality, human rights, inclusivity, collaboration, diversity and inclusion in the progress to a global society. society. So really, uh, it, it seems like the, the UN Charter is talking open culture and in open, uh, an open society. Um, now I will go through very briefly through some kind of ideas and uh, some of uh, uh, suggestion how to address this, the, the question that we, we had at the beginning on how we can combine together the three components of the, the, the open culture that is developing, the sustainable development goal, and how we can make the, an impact and how we can use open source culture to leverage uh, the achievement on the sustainable development goals. So. Um, how do we move forward? I, it, it is clear to, to, to me that uh, we cannot leave anybody behind. So the COVID-19 pandemic <laughs> just reminded that, uh, reminded this to us and we, we cannot, uh, you know, uh, have the first world vaccinated and the, and the third world not. So we will never going to be all protected by this type of global events. So the SDG challenges can only be won through a we call it the digital multilateralism, uh, which is open and inclusive. Uh, we have already around 20 countries who have established ambassadors for innovation. So there's a, a clear understanding that we need to bring innovation and technology innovation in a digital multilateralism um, discussion. So we also really need to work on economies of scale uh, and, and innovative business models, including open business models, that we need to really avoid reinventing the wheel in this time of scarce resources availability. So one of the one of the options is really to be to be working further on on with open source heroes. These are the guys that are probably listening to this today. They have been, you know, understood the, 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 the ideas and, and the, the concept behind open source, and we need to support them. You know, the, as you know, the, um, the latest studies from the European Commission on open source shows that one dollar in invested into open source uh, um, industry uh, produces a four dollar benefit into the economy so this is a no-brainer anymore and also from from the perspective of of uh, of uh, dollars uh, uh, average so let's engage on with all the actors of the technology ecosystem and stop thinking inter interoperability let's flip the approach i will talk a bit more about this but this is a concept of you know we need to move forward and and do do something different to ensure that we are uh, stopping uh, the, the reinventing the wheel process. So how we can combine the need to create a society which is global and inclusive and has to address similar pro problems everywhere with the digital public goods. Let's, to me, it's, it's a no-brainer to open the code of all the software products that we have been, implement, that have been implemented with taxpayer money and making sure that these elevate to digital public goods that are available and usable and, and reusable and reapplied uh, applied to in, in relevant environments where there's a need for those, those technical solution, technology solutions. So we need to work together, resolving global programs with global solutions. You know, the, the EU COVID apps, uh, you know, approach has been, you know, very, uh, specific and very um, compartmentalized and then you know when I was talking to some of the developers of these various solutions like each country developed their own solution they were saying well we will you know make the make them interoperable afterwards okay so that's the idea that I want to bring forward here um, you know if we wanted to to have these type of solutions uh, assisting Africa in the context of COVID it's indeed the, the open source approach and the in, you know integrated approach would have absolutely facilitated the last mile. And so my idea is really to let's turn around the model of building our solutions in our little garden and then thinking about interoperability afterwards with other solutions uh, somewhere. I think we should just think of ap approaching these these problems with with the open source approach, with the open culture approach, or really 
to openly contribute to one solution, then then of course doesn't need to be interoperable interoperable with other solution because it's the solution that everybody built together. So that's the idea you know, of flipping the the paradigm of um, you know let's build something you know for us and then you know somebody else will do it for them and then we'll try to make it interoperable. But the problem is global, so we need to start thinking about that from that perspective. So. Um, I would also, you know, go further and say that we need to work with the public sector and push for the adoption of, uh, of digital public goods. We need to assist the public sector to go into that direction. We need to establish an the, the open source program office and support the public sector to um, um, establish these uh, these offices with the with their the main goal of converting. Uh, the countries and and at different layers of all their, their administration in in an on an open culture approach of uh, adopting concrete issues which are uh, public goods and let's work with the private sector as well to demonstrate what are the best practices of doing that because you know the private sector has been doing that already for some time and all, all we need to do underneath of all this is really invest in education of all decision makers across the, the public administrations to ensure that we are moving forward in, in the digital public goods um, arena. Another question that we had at the beginning is was really, you know, how can we uh, accelerate developing countries in achieving the development milestones uh, through open source technology? So I, in my view, we need to explain that the true SDG revolution can only happen if a minimum common denominator levels up in all countries. We are as strong as the as the less strong uh, uh, party in, or actor into, into the community. So we really need to make sure that we level up the, the development countries uh, capacity. So economy, economy, health, environment, culture improve only if society is, is united and, and inclusive uh, globally. So let's demonstrate that uh, open technology is accessible at lower cost. It really depends on appropriate human resource availability. And again, the, the, the education uh, paradigm here is, is key. But developing countries have enormous potential in engaging with youth, having a very uh, easy access to and, and cost-effective access to technology development. So I think we need to engage with, the, with developing countries and their youth to build together a sustainable future with education. And the last bit I want to touch on is really how we combine the open business model with open source technology, because we, we cannot, you know, again, we said at the beginning and, we, and it's a big realization we no actors of the technology innovation environment uh, can do this alone. We need to cooperate. We need to co we need to um, um, collaborate and uh, open business models are are sustainable. You know, we know that uh, uh, the, the top tech uh, giants uh, are, are using our contributors to open source software. The models of freemium and SaaS are sustainable business models. So there's a there's an incredible um, uh, developing uh, industry around this. Maybe we should enrich the, the SaaS model with DAS and data as a service models to ensure that data can also be monetized while it has been uh, collected through open source solution, obviously, having in, in uh, very much in in uh, on the forefront the concept of privacy ethical parameters on, on data uh, management uh, and uh, human rights so let's ensure that there is a direct correl correlation between the private sector interest with the social dimension of the digital public goods and open business models for me is is the way forward so i want i want go further and i would just stop here because otherwise uh, you know the, 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 there's too much and uh, the attention span of of humans have measured at seven minutes so i'm already gone uh, beyond but in conclusion the, the sdg clearly outlined the sustainable development horizon for for our planet the open culture is essential for progress of society to compound collaboration inclusivity human rights privacy protection and and so on and with the goal to leave nobody behind. And the open business is, for me, the new frontier for new models of technology sustainability and accessibility. 
I will be around uh, at uh, FOSS for any questions and, and answers, and I'll be happy to to continue the discussion, not only at FOSS backstage, but uh, but even you know uh, further and beyond. So here are my contact details, and thanks again for having me today. Happy to be with you. Thank you.